uh, I'll take you back to French Polynesia for the, the next 10 minutes following uh, Louis' presentation. I think my short presentation tonight uh, is actually turning to be a, a nice compliment to both Louis and uh, Stuart's presentation earlier. Uh, and I would like to discuss uh, sort of different kind of uh, powerful stone in Eastern Polynesia. So as we said before, within uh, the Polynesian Triangle, the Maori people have erected open air ritual structures varying in size and complexity from small family altars to large chiefdom temples and complex such as Tapotea. While these are known under different names, uh, such as Heiau in Hawaii or Moai on Easter Island, they are referred to as the Marae Complex in New Zealand, the Cook Islands, and the Central Region uh, that forms two different Polynesia where uh, I conduct all of my uh, research. So here I would like to present some ideas on the ritual use of coral material in such a uh, sacred context. Uh, for that, just a few words about the Polynesian volcanic islands uh, that present a large uh, variety of environments and geological settings. So for instance, some like Tahiti are relatively young high islands with a lagoon and clinking reefs while others are much older and already face subsidence turning into local atolls like Nutramodin. While the basalt material is naturally lacking on the atolls, coral material, on the other hand, is present and available everywhere in different forms. Uh, beach rock slabs can be extracted from the shores. Large domes and branch formations of Torites and Acropora coral are accessible in the coastal waters and lagoons. And of course, a vast quantity of dead, worn coral is constantly washed away uh, on the beaches by cyclones and tsunamis. Coral was therefore a common material in Polynesian environment, which explains why it was used to manufacture daily artifacts such as files and founders. However, uh, coral was also incorporated into sacred contexts for different purposes. Coral used in the construction itself from foundation to the top structures has long been well documented by uh, archaeologists. But I will also review here briefly uh, three other kinds of what I call applications that are less documented or discussed in the literature. Uh, first, the development of some specialized ritual features that met a specific ritual need for the community. Uh, second, offerings of coral, usually in the forms of branches. And finally, the manufacture of ritual uh, paraphernalia, of which a few examples are uh, known. So coral has been used extensively in the construction of the main elements of the Marae sites, including the altars, the cysts, the platforms, and the low walls. Obviously, this is the only material used for Marae in the Tuamotu atolls, although the construction styles differ throughout the region. Here, I put on the left uh, an example from Reau, where the Au is made of uh, piled up coral slabs. In contrast with neighboring high islands, where most structures are made of volcanic stones, the choice of material was thus considered once simply as a rational economic decision regarding its availability in the surrounding environment. That being said, uh, in the Leeward Islands, for instance, both basalt and coral construction coexist in the architectural landscape. Uh, I show you here on the top right a picture of the restoration project that was led by uh, Yoshi Sinoto at the Marae Manunu on Wahine in the 1980s and bring your attention to the massive coral slabs erected up front, as well as the large quantity of coral blocks in the peeling of the platform. It is quite similar to the Tapatapotia structures that we uh, showed you uh, previously. So in these cases, one can argue that only beach rock and slabs can be shaped in such impressive dimensions and thus contribute to display the power of the chiefs to which they belong. As such, the choice of coral material can be explained as a reflection of economic and social political ambitions from the owners. But on smaller sites, we also found coral integrated in the stone constructions. It is, for instance, quite common to discover shaped coral blocks in the foundation lines of platforms, uh, as here on the picture on the bottom right, on the Perirao site in Moria Island. Uh, as they relate to the construction phase of the Marae, my colleagues uh, Pat Kirch, Warren Sharp, and Jim Kahn have produced a high resolution chronology for the edification of temples in the valleys, thanks to the uranium thorium dating method uh, that we are currently applying elsewhere uh, in the region. And some archaeologists have also argued that these less frequent uh, coral pieces could have served an aesthetic purpose, introducing some white colors in the original uh, dark gray monument. 
The second application I wanted to talk about tonight is what I call the specialized features, of which I will show you two examples here. So the photo on the left is an upright uh, coral slab about two meters high, part of a series of slabs planting in the ground of the Mara in Pangatao in Tuamoru. Uh, slabs were systematically associated to the altars, although few of them were human shaped as this one. Uh, some others further display shoulders and arms in addition to the projected head. For the Paumotu people, these upright stones called keho were the repository for the spirits of the ancestors during the ceremonies, while also acting as memory stones in the genealogies of the clans. As such, they serve the same purpose as the markers in Kiki or the Rapanui Mohai, and of course, echo the stone found by Lui at Tapotapotea. The photo on the right is uh, Ruatu. This is the structure in the middle of the photo. Uh, this is a small platform delimited by slabs on edge filled with large coral branches and pieces. The oral traditions mentioned that people came to the Marae to deposit the coral to this altar and asking the gods favor for either a fruitful fishing party or a calm sea prior canoe trip to another island. Then when reaching the destination, the travelers also brought the coral to the Marae belonging to the kings to thank the deities. The Ruat who were then built up through time by constant depositing of coral branches. Speaking of offerings, uh, oral traditions and archaeology have also documented coral depositions in various contexts. In Tahiti, for example, the priests used to bury a coral branch in the ground before the construction of a Marae site. In the Marquesas, I also discovered coral branches on ritual structures on the island of Wahuka. This includes the Meai in the Valnaunau Valley on the left photo here, uh, where a branch of Posiopora coral was found on a small area paved with basalt pebbles. Uh, that I dated to AD 1787. Uh, More surprising was the discovery of coral branches in the tapu structure erected on top of the island in a fortified refugee site located on a high plateau between 700 and 800 meters of altitude. This one was dated to uh, AD 1394. This, of course, raises the question of the intention behind such deposits in a very remote marginal uh, location. Finally, I wanted to mention the use of coral to manufacture ritual paraphernalia, especially magic stones or fertility stones. Such objects are quite rare today, but some have survived in collections. Uh, I included here some examples of coral effigies from the Tuamorus. Uh, the museum in Tahiti holds a specimen of what we call the new Maru, the total effigy used prior to the sacrifices of the totals at the Marae. Uh, some other examples were recovered by Emory in the 1930s during the surveys of the archipelago. The turtles were particularly important in rituals as the migrations back to the islands marked the beginning of the abundance uh, season blessed by the ancestors. Magic accessories also include fertility stones from the Society Islands, the Austral Islands, and the Marquesas, usually representing a fish called the Punaia or a turtle Punaon. Several specimens are curated in collections, both in volcanic stone and uh, coral. So I will turn now to some concluding remarks and, and just brief ideas that hopefully will foster uh, more discussions. Um, there is obviously no doubt that using coral for building altars and cysts or to shape upright stones likely reflects an adaptation of the Polynesian Marae concept to some local environments where the coral material is either more easily accessible or the only one available around. Additionally, large beach rock pieces and slabs are easier to shape for building impressive structures, thus reflecting the economic and social political power of the chiefs. However, documenting the various applications and the distributions of coral features and objects in different environments further suggests that coral material was deliberately selected among or in addition to other materials such as volcanic stone and wood. For me, it indicates that coral was ritually valued in many ways and reflects an intention connected to the ritual processes. Of course, this leaves us with the trickiest question of why. Why depositing coral branches to the gods before visiting of kings in a distant island? Why burying a coral piece in the ground before building a marae? And why bringing a coral to a site at 800 meters of altitude? Coral traditions and ethnography remain pretty elusive on this topic, at least in providing direct evidence of ritual use of coral. But we may seek for interpretations in the larger religious and social political frameworks of the Polynesian societies. 
Now, I don't want to go too far in details here because basically this idea will be uh, uh, presented in the, in the focus paper next month at the uh, IME region conference, but I still want to uh, uh, say a few words uh, here. So for the ancient Polynesians, the ocean was considered as the primordial marae on which people traveled, expanded, and cultivated connections on board the canoes. Many linguistic, ethnographic, and archival information support the deep connection between canoes and marae, the later being described in the oral literature as a stone canoe that landed on the shore. Chiefdoms and social units of the clans were also structured as the various parts of the voyaging canoes, which is clearly attested in a shared vocabulary between these two semantic fields. The identity and organization of the communities are thus entangled within the ceremonial places that connects the people to the ocean and the land. We may therefore hypothesize that the selection and integration of coral, a stone from the sea, into the sacred realm served to materialize uh, such connections. And 